Thank you for joining us in our next video that uh, deals with a study of the book of Hebrews. Uh, we've looked at some introductory matters. I encourage you to go back to the first video and study those things. Uh, we spent some time looking at the structure of the book. I'll call your attention briefly to these things. Uh, thinking about chapters one through four as a unit. Actually, there are two literary units, one and two, and then three and four. But Jesus is a faithful and merciful high priest. Chapter one, because he is son of God. Chapter two, because he is son of man. Faithful and merciful high priest. Chapter two, verses 17 and 18. As a faithful high priest, uh, he is able to bring his people to rest. So that 414 speaks of the Son of God who has gone into the heavens and appears on our behalf. But it's not just that he can intercede for us in God's presence with regard to our sin. But we also have one who sympathizes with our situation and is able to present our needs and to help us uh, and give us strength in times of difficulty. So beginning in chapter 5, in uh, the last video that we did in this series, uh, we looked at Jesus' uh, better priestly ministry. All of this depends on chapter 8 and verse 1. This is the principal point of the book. The point of what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest. We met it in chapter 2, 17 and 18. We saw it again in 4, 14 through 16. Here it is again. There have been various references to Jesus as high priest explaining his better priestly ministry. But the point is this, 8-1, the point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. We have that kind of high priest. Now look at chapter 8 and verse 6. I don't have that up here. Yes, I do. Chapter 8, verse 6. And see the summary of the book. The ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs, to the Old Testament priesthood, Old Testament high priest. The ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, founded on better promises. These three things, the ministry of Jesus, chapters 5 through 7, the better covenant because the first was effective. This is 8, 7 through 10, 18 specifically. Uh, there's kind of a parenthetical use of Jeremiah 31 that encompasses that and closes that section. And then the better promises uh, that we'll study uh, in the, uh, the next uh, or final lesson in this series. So today we come to chapter 8 and verse 1, the better covenant, uh, specifically chapter 8 and verse 7. The point of what we're having saying, however, in chapter 8, 1, is we have such a high priest he ministers not in an earthly tabernacle, but in a heavenly tabernacle. If he were in an earthly tabernacle, it would be required to give gifts and uh, sacrifices again and again. But he serves in a, in a heavenly tabernacle. The things here are just a shadow. The Old Testament things were just a copy of all of that. Even as Moses was given the instructions, that was a copy, a pattern that was shown him. But Jesus has a superior ministry, superior covenant, and superior promises. Now let's look beginning in 8, verse 7. If there hadn't been anything wrong with the first covenant, there wouldn't have been a need for the second. This is not something new that the author of Hebrews is inventing. This is something that was also reflected in Jeremiah 31. The Lord says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with the forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. This is going to be a better covenant. They did not remain faithful to the first covenant. What we're seeing in chapters 8, 9, and 10, the first part of 10, is a number of defects, a number of things that were wrong, a number of shortcomings in the uh, old covenant. They did not remain faithful. And so I turned away from them. Um, in this new covenant, uh, I will put their laws, my laws, in their minds, in their hearts. They won't just be written externally on tablets of stone. I will be their God. They will be my people. There'll be relationship. No longer will a man have to teach his neighbor or his brother saying, Know the Lord. Everyone will know me. And the old covenant, people were born into the covenant. They had to be taught to know the Lord. They got to the time of their confirmation in a bar mitzvah or bath mitzvah. They were going to become a son or daughter of the faith. And they had to be taught to know the Lord. But that's not that way in the new covenant with Jesus. In the new covenant, everyone knows the Lord. If you're a part of the new covenant, you know the Lord. 
because that's a requirement for being a part of the new covenant. All will know me from the least to the greatest. And there will be complete forgiveness and there will not be a remembrance of sins. All of these things, and there's going to be even more in chapter 9. But by describing these things, the first is obviously obsolete and it will disappear. Now let's talk a little bit more about that beginning in 9 and verse 1. The first covenant had various regulations. There's a list of them, but look at verse 5. He says, we cannot discuss these things in detail now. But here's the point. The high priest entered the most holy place once a year. He went into the inner room. This is 9-7. That's the most holy place once a year, always with blood, never without blood. He offered for himself and for the sins of the people. What did all of that mean? 9 8 the holy spirit was showing through this that the way into the holy place was not yet open it had not yet been revealed as long as that first covenant was there you could not have continual access it was only once a year it was only by a limited number of people actually one person the high priest who entered and so entry into the presence of god was not yet possible the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was standing. All of those regulations were external. All of them dealt with external things, but they were not able to change the inside. They were not able to cleanse the consciences of the worshipers. All of these gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clean the conscience, clear the conscience. They were just external regulations that applied until the time would come for perpetual entry, the new order into God's presence. So Christ came as a high priest uh, and went through not the way to the earthly tabernacle, but to the more perfect tabernacle, the one that is not man-made, the one that is not a part of this creation, is not a part of the created order, is not a part of the experience of this world, not with the blood of bulls and goats of calves, but with his own blood and redemption he obtained, therefore, is not annual, but is eternal. Now, the blood of bulls and goats were sprinkled, and that was sanctifying, but it only sanctified with regard to outward cleanliness. The blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself, cleanses consciences. It's able to touch our inside so that we can serve the living God. So Christ is mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called receive the promised inheritance as heirs. We are able to be heirs of God because we are sons of God. We enter God's presence. We have access to God. This verse depends on the idea that in the, the original word that's used in the, the text in Greek, uh, it refers to both a legal document and also to a last will and testament. So here is a legal document, but it is also a last will and testament. So this all comes together to show that law is being replaced, legal requirements are being replaced, things that were a part of the former system are being replaced, but this is also presented to us under the figure of a will. And thus is necessary the death of Jesus, the new will doesn't take effect as long as the one making it is living. So blood is shed, even as under the first covenant. In the first covenant, the blood of the calves, together with the wool and the hyssop, all of that was sprinkled, everything was cleansed. And in verse 23, it is necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. That's all, everything on earth, they were copies of the heavenly things. They all had to be purified and so the same thing occurs as Christ does not enter a man-made sanctuary, only a copy of the true one, but enters heaven itself, verse 24, to appear for us in God's presence. It's not said in the text why the celestial things had to be cleansed. I don't know whether this was an understanding of the rabbis in the first century or whether um, there's some way that this connection is made, but the entry is made possible because all has been cleansed. The worshiper is cleansed. The way is cleansed. Uh, all aspects of uh, being in God's presence are made possible through cleansing. So Jesus appears for us 
in God's presence. He does not have to appear again and again on earth to offer sacrifices because he enters once into the most holy place in heaven. In the earthly model, the high priest had to enter the most holy place every year with the blood of the bulls and goats. If Christ were functioning under the old covenant, he would have to be sacrificed again and again. But that's not what happened. He appeared once on earth, participating in the human experience. He appeared once here on earth, once for all, at the end of the ages to do away with sin by sacrificing himself. And so Christ's sacrifice was once for all in the same way that we die once, but he will come a second time and appear to bring salvation to those who eagerly await him. So it's interesting to note in this text, three times it says Christ appears. He appeared on earth to make sacrifice of himself once for all. He now appears before God in heaven interceding for us, presenting our case. He will appear a second time on earth, not to deal with sin again, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And so what we see is that Christ's sacrifice was once for all. We see the list of difficulties that were present under the old system. The lack of uh, forgiveness, uh, the lack of confidence, uh, the lack of cleansing of the conscience, uh, the fact that it was all external, the fact that it um, uh, was not able to enter a permanent, uh, make a permanent way of entry uh, into the most holy place, all of those things and more the law is thus 10-1, only a shadow of good things coming. In the law, the same sacrifices repeated again and again endlessly could never make perfect those who drew near. If there had been the forgiveness of sins, we could have stopped making the sacrifice. But as long as there are sacrifices, they were an annual reminder of sins. The reason is that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. The blood of Jesus takes away sin. Remember what we said about the replacement of the priesthood. Up to a certain point in time, we have the Levitical priesthood. The priesthood of Aaron, his high priest, and those who followed him. At that point, Jesus' high priesthood replaces the Levitical priesthood and functions. And our typical way of looking at this is to say, well, here we have the Levitical priesthood, and then at the time of Jesus' death, we have the beginning of his priesthood. But if you notice what's said in chapter uh, 9 and verse 15, for this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive eternal inheritance. He has died as a ransom to set them free from sins committed under the first covenant. This also is a part of chapter 3 of Romans, verses 25 and 26, that Jesus' death dealt with the sins that were committed under the old covenant. So we have the priesthood and then the priesthood replaced. But as Jesus' priesthood comes, it not only functions from this point forward, it's replacing the Levitical priesthood. It functions to forgive the sins that were present under the old covenant and also the sins that are committed under the new covenant. So the replacement part, the replacement priesthood, high priesthood of Jesus functions for the entirety of that time. The blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. Christ came to make sacrifice and offering and to do the Father's will. And so 1010 says, by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. In the old system, the priest stood every day performing his duties. Jesus offered himself once for all for the sacrifice of sins, 1012 sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he makes perfect forever those who are being made holy. Note here the reference back to chapter 2, verses 10, 11, and 12. The one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are of the same family. He makes perfect forever those who are being made holy. And so we have another reference, as I've already mentioned, to Jeremiah 31. The covenant I will make with them, I will put my laws in their hearts, write them on my minds. It's a, a smaller uh, quotation from Jeremiah 31. 
But the point is that the sins will be remembered no more. And when there is genuine forgiveness, there is no longer a need for sacrifice. And so we come to this point in the book. Um, perhaps it would have been better to have been looking uh, at uh, this particular outline. Jesus better ministry, chapters 5 through 7. Jesus better covenant. This is chapters 8, 7 through 10, 18 that we've studied in this video. And then we will see the better promises. This is all on the basis of chapter 8 and verse 1. The, the point of what we're saying is we have that kind of high priest, 8, 6, who brings a better ministry, is mediator of a better covenant, and is founded upon better promises. So the point of chapters 9 and 10 specifically, or 10, 1 through 18, is that Jesus has given a better sacrifice. And on the basis of his better sacrifice, we have also a better covenant. So that brings us to uh, somewhat of a stopping point. Uh, perhaps it would be good for us to very quickly uh, see where we are. Uh, we have looked at three of the five admonitions. As soon as we begin our study uh, in the next video, we will be looking at the fourth admonition in chapter 10, verse 22 to 25. Therefore, let us draw near as we go back to the structure of the book of Hebrews. And here's what we're seeing. We've worked our way all the way down to 1018. A faithful, merciful high priest, son of God, son of man. Chapter 1, chapter 2 able to bring God's people to rest, to the uh, rest with God, that they might cease from their labors, eternal rest, but also a sense of our rest in Jesus Christ, coming to me all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All of that in view in chapter 3, chapter 4, the admonition, be faithful, develop fidelity, develop faithfulness. And then on the basis of Jesus' high priesthood, again mentioned in 4.14 through 16, he has a better priestly ministry. It's not a Levitical um, high priesthood. It is a high priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. It's necessary to mature spiritually, to grasp this. Uh, we encourage you. We believe that you're on the right path. Keep going. We have persuaded the better things for you. But this depends upon the promise that God has made first to Abraham, what he said, what he swore. And the same thing with Jesus. So Jesus is a merciful high priest, but he is also a faithful high priest. He is a Melchizedek kind of high priest. The point is, we have that kind of high priest. He is the mediator of a better covenant. And in this video, we study that better covenant. Understanding that the better sacrifice of Jesus makes possible a covenant that brings us to perfection because where sins are forgiven there is no longer the need for sacrifice for sin so next video we will uh, talk further beginning in 1019 and we'll be looking specifically uh, at uh, the instructions that uh, we have uh, in this uh, particular word of exhortation draw near encourage one another stimulate one another meet together uh, and this will introduce for us a number of calls. A call to draw near, do not step back timidly. A call to faith in the one who is promised and also in the promises that are provided. A call to perseverance so that we do not miss the grace of God. And finally, in the concluding chapter, uh, we will see a call to joyful Christian living. So there we have, um, in a, a summary way, the uh, book of Hebrews, uh, an understanding of the book of Hebrews. Uh, I hope that you'll study it for yourself, that you'll read it for yourself, uh, that you will commit to uh, finishing the study in our next video, and that you'll remember always to have your Bible with you. Uh, I'm reading out of the NIV, but it does not matter. Uh, whichever text that you may wish to bring, whatever version, translation you may wish to bring, it will serve us well in our study. And we'll begin by saying, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. May God bless you in your study of Hebrews. Have a great day.